Good evening. Welcome to St. Bartholomew the Apostle Church. We gathered in this sacred space today to celebrate the liturgy for the solemnity of the most holy body and blood of Christ. Please stand and share a greeting with those around you. Our presider today is Father John, assisted by Deacon Bob. Our entrance hymn is Table of Plenty. Good evening. We have a special welcome this evening, a special guest of honor, Keegan Scarpa, who's going to receive Holy Communion for the first time this evening. Keegan, welcome and thank you for being here. <laughs> Keegan will join us in the greatest love story ever told, Jesus' love for us in the Eucharist around this altar. And so let us begin with the sign of our victory, the power of the cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. My brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins, and so prepare ourselves to celebrate these sacred mysteries. Lord Jesus, you come to us in word, in sacrament, and in one another. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ Jesus, you sustain us with your body and blood. Christ have mercy. Christ have mercy. Lord Jesus, you satisfy the hunger of every human heart. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. You take away the sins of the world 
Let us pray. O God, who in this wonderful sacrament have left us a memorial of your passion, grant us, we pray, so to revere the sacred mysteries of your body and blood that we may always experience in ourselves the fruits of your redemption. Who live and reign with the God the Father in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. When Moses came to the people and related all the words and ordinances of the Lord, they all answered with one voice, we will do everything that the Lord has told us. Moses then wrote down all the, all the words of the Lord and said, and rising early the next day, he erected at the foot of the mountain an altar and 12 pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel. Then, having sent certain young men of the Israelites to offer holocausts and sacrifice young bulls as peace offerings to the Lord, Moses took half of the blood and put it in large bowls. The other half he splashed on the altar. Taking the book of the covenant, he read it aloud to the people who answered, all that the Lord has said, we will heed and do. Then he took the blood and sprinkled it on the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words of his. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, when Christ came as high priest of the good things that have to come to be, passing through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made by hands, that is, not belonging to this creation, he entered once for all into the sanctuary, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of a heifer's ashes can sanctify those who are defiled so that their flesh is cleansed, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from dead works to worship the living God. For this reason, he is mediator of a new covenant, since a death has taken place for deliverance from transgressions under the first covenant. Those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? He sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a jar of water follow him. Wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room there where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. Make the preparations for us there. The disciples then went off, entered the city, and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. While they were eating, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, and they all drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which will be shed for many. Amen, I say to you, I shall not drink again the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And then, after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. This is good news, the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. It may interest you to know that today's liturgical feast of the body and blood of Jesus is a rather late one. It was established in the 13th century. So the question is why, after 1100 years, did the church feel it necessary uh, to do this? A parable will explain why. So once upon a time, there was this very gracious and wealthy man who always threw a dinner party about once a month for his closest friends. There were times of wonderful food and vintage wine, a time of joy, 
great intimacy and sharing. Well, it so happened that on one of the occasions, few of the closest friends got sick around the same time, and so they were unable to attend. The man felt bad, but nevertheless, he wanted them to have a memento of the celebration they missed. And so he took a bottle of his best wine, he took it from the table, and he put it in a, in a small ornate box. And he set it up on the sideboard where it could be seen. He knew his friends would see it, eventually open the box, and enjoy the wine knowing that they had not been forgotten. So he went to his servant and told him, Pierre, be careful of that box and make sure that you treat it with respect because what's in there will gladden the hearts of my friends and they will always think of me. Well, the servant wasn't quite sure what the master meant, but being of rigid mind, every time he passed the box, he bowed to it. Eventually, the bowing became a habit. Well, it so happened that that very week, the master suddenly died. But he had often expressed his wish that his friends would continue those monthly meals in his memory, and so they did. When they arrived in good spirits at the next gathering, the servant pointed out to his joyful friends the special box. They were intrigued, but they didn't help but notice, or they couldn't help but notice, how the servant bowed each time he passed it. Unsure why he was doing this, it wasn't long before they too began to bow to the box before they sat down for dinner. For some reason, perhaps a sense of awe, none of them ever asked what was in the beautiful box. So as time went on, that box, sitting there silently on the sideboard for all to see, had a depressing effect to it. The meals began to grow less and less joyful and more and more quiet, to the point where finally, instead of celebrating being together as friends, they began to eat in silence and to gaze with respect at the box, although it started to dwindle, never knowing exactly what was in the box, that there was a bottle of fine wine meant to be happily shared among them, a gift from the wealthy man but it remained unopened and unused. And friends, that's what happened to the Eucharist. In earlier times, people had a very close and intimate relationship with this sacrament. It was, after all, a shared meal reflective of the intimate Last Supper. They would even take home some fragments for consumption by the family during the week. Some, even children, would bring, bring that sacred bread hidden on their persons to Christians in jail cells. But by the 13th century, all that history had been forgotten. By that time, the Eucharist, in its ornate tabernacle box, still sitting there, had become an awesome yet remote mystery, something to be bowed to and approached with fear and trembling, and then only very rarely and very, by very specially chosen people would they actually open the box and receive the Eucharist. The people felt that they were not worthy. So the Eucharist became something hidden inside the box or to be looked at with bowed heads from afar. So as when the priest elevated, such as when the priest elevated the host at Mass, and that was all. All of this, of course, was a far cry from the generous and intimate fellowship meals Jesus shared with the poor and the unworthy, so much so that the Pharisees complained that he ate with publicans and sinners. It was a far cry from the Last Supper, where there were only rough fishermen present when Jesus broke bread and shared wine. The bar for approaching Jesus was obviously set pretty low in the beginning. So centuries later, why were people staying away? The church slowly began to realize this sad state of affairs and finally had to legislate that people receive 
the Eucharist at least once a year to establish feasts like this one we're celebrating today, the body and blood of Christ, in the hope that the people would remember its true meaning and Jesus' desire to be near us, so to speak, to unlock the box. Servant of God, Walter Shizek, a Polish-American Jesuit who served as a missionary in the Soviet Union during the war-torn and tumultuous years of the mid-20th century. He spent over 20 years in a gulag, and he writes in his memoir, He Leadeth Me, he describes his experience of presiding at Eucharist as a prisoner in a Siberian gulag. Facing constant threat of reprisal for celebrating the sacraments alone and in the community, the faithful in the camps waited until noon to break fast, observing the Eucharistic fast throughout the night and morning. Shizek recalls, in small groups, the prisoners would shuffle into the assigned places, and there the priest would say mass in his working uniform, in his working clothes, unwashed, disheveled, bundle up against the cold. We said mass in drafty storage shacks or huddled in the mud and slush in the, corning, in the corner of a building site foundation. The intensity of devotion of both priests and prisoners made up for everything. There was no altar, no candle, no flowers, no music, no snow white linens, stained glass, or the warmth that even the simplest parish church could provide. Yet in these primitive conditions, he continues, the Mass brought you closer to God than anyone might conceivably imagine. The realization of what was happening on the board, the box, or the stone used in place of the altar penetrated deep into the soul. Shizak, who would return to the United States following his captivity, noted that no other inspiration could have deepened my faith more, could have given me more spiritual courage than the privilege of saying Mass for these poorest and most deprived members of Christ, the Good Shepherd's flock. You know, perhaps you've heard stories like this before, powerful stories of sacraments celebrated as resistance in the face of oppression and evil. Unfortunately, the reality of religious persecution experienced by Christians throughout the centuries continues today, but has also been well documented. These stories remind us of the humbling power of the Eucharist. Our fast from the Eucharist for this past year because of the pandemic reminds us perhaps that it is possible to get too comfortable. Perhaps a reason why the bishops have removed the dispensation not to attend Mass beginning this weekend. And this isn't a new phenomenon. For generations, people of faith have at times lost sight of the importance of the nourishment found in the breaking of the bread. For example, Moses had to remind the Jewish people who had been, become comfortable in the years following the journey out of Egypt of the food provided them in the times of great spiritual hunger. Today, the act of gathering around this altar is also an act of resistance, no matter how familiar the celebration of the Eucharist may be to us. It's a bold act in the midst of and on behalf of a community of believers. We approach the table from all sorts of different places and perspectives, becoming one in sharing Christ's body and blood. We walk together as a community toward the promise of new life, setting aside the darkness of differences and resentments. There are lots of things we could say about the Eucharist, but in light of the world in which we live and the injustices we see in our culture, 
let us focus on these key two key words reflected in the Eucharist unity and mission unity and mission unity so the Eucharist among other things calls us to unity to disregard distinction between rich and poor to disregard the distinction between high class and low class celebrity and ordinary black and white both around the altar itself and afterwards outside of the church it this was the very thing that first drew Dorothy Day for example to Christianity she noticed at the Eucharist, she noticed how the rich and the poor, the black and the white, the young and the old, knelt side by side, all equal at that moment, adoring the Lord. Sadly, we often don't take this unity dimension of the Eucharist seriously. You know, there's a common tendency to think that the practice of justice, especially social justice, is an optional part of being Christian something mandated by political correctness rather than by the Gospels. Generally, we hear the call to actively reach out to the poor and correct injustices as something from which we can exempt ourselves. But we are wrong with this. In the Gospels and in the Scriptures in general, the call to reach out to the marginalized and to help create justice in our world is as important as keeping the commandments and going to church. Indeed, striving for unity must be part of all authentic worship. They complement each other. The challenge to reach out to the downcast and to serve others is an integral and non-negotiable part of being a Christian. And this challenge is contained in the Eucharist itself. This altar it calls us to unity and tasks us with building unity. Mission. A famous church hymn says it well. We move from worship into service. Called from worship into service, forth in your great name we go. To the child, the youth, the aged, love in living deeds to show. Hope and health, good will and comfort, counsel, aid and peace we give. That your children, Lord, in freedom, may your mercy know and live. Not too bad. How beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Alfari, not too bad, right? Yes. I mean, you could have done it better, but nonetheless. But the point being, the Eucharist from at the beginning is not a private devotional prayer, but it is rather a communal act of worship which calls us to go forth and live out in the world what we celebrate inside the church. The Eucharist calls us to love tenderly, but just as strongly it calls us to act in justice and to forgive with the mercy of God. I'm reminded of a situation when I, I took a middle school catechism class into the church here and I gave them a guided tour of the church. I identified and explained the altar furnishings, the vessels, the, the stained glass, the vestments. And then I called on each student to say what from what they had seen had made the deepest impression on them. Young, one young man, sort of a, a wise guy, we'll call him David, uh, had a, a bit of a reputation of being a wise guy. So I called on him and he said, uh, Father John, I was most impressed by the exit sign. So I said to him, well, explain that to me. And this is what he said. It seems to me that it's only when we pass under the exit sign that we really and finally see whether what we did inside the church has made any difference at all. And that's from the mouth of a child. As we go underneath that exit sign, will it make any difference out there from what we did inside of the church? 
do this in memory of me, are words that are said out loud every Mass. Question, what should we do in memory of him? Meet in the assembly and celebrate this ancient ritual? Of course. But it goes deeper than that, much deeper. Remember that before those words, do this in memory of me, are these words. This is my body given for you. This is my blood shed for you. That's what we do in Jesus' memory. You know, as we've given his body and blood, as he's given his body and blood for us, we should also give our body, our blood for others in his memory. That is to say, justice, mercy, and sacrifice should characterize those who have received these gifts from Christ himself. Friends, that's our mission, to be sent out from here, bearing the gifts of faith, hope, and love that are strengthened in here. The Eucharist is unity, it's mission. Unity says that we're all connected. Mission says that we're all sent, sent to share what we have celebrated. The parting words at Mass say it all. So the deacon says, the priest, the Mass is ended, go in peace. Now that word Mass, maybe you know or don't know, but in Latin it's the word for mission. Therefore, when we leave here, in a very real sense, our Mass is just beginning. Call from worship into service, for in your great name we go. To the child, the youth, the aged, love in living deeds to show. Hope and health, goodwill and comfort, counsel, aid, and peace we give. That your children, Lord, in freedom, may your mercy know and live. Together, let us proudly profess our faith as we say, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Our God feeds us with the finest wheat, nourishing body and soul in gratitude and faith let us now bring our prayers before the throne of grace. For the church, that we will live as Eucharistic people, sacrificing and sharing ourselves as Christ does for us, so that all may have life, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear Lord. our prayer. For Christian unity, that Christ's body and blood given for us may heal all the divisions within the Christian community 
and bind us together into one body in love and service, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who hunger physically or spiritually, that through the manna of God's word and our loving service, they may be nourished in body and soul, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all ministers of the Eucharist, especially those who serve the sick and homebound, that they may grow in faith through their service and be signs of God's love and healing presence to others, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have been unable to share in the Eucharist due to the pandemic, that the word of God and the love of fellow Christians may bring them strength and support, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And for our beloved dead, that our Heavenly Father may welcome them home to the eternal banquet. We remember especially Mary Ann Walter, Bob Khalil, Thomas J. Sharkey, and Josephine Cook. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us take a few moments to add our own intentions in silence. Through the intercession of Our Lady, we place all our needs and concerns in the loving heart of Jesus as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Mm -hmm. Please pray with me that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Amen. Grant your church, O Lord, we pray, the gifts of unity and peace, whose signs are to be seen in mystery in the offerings we here present, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For at the last supper with his apostles, establishing for the ages to come the saving memorial of the cross, he offered himself to you as the unblemished lamb, the acceptable gift of perfect praise. Nourishing your faithful by this sacred mystery, you make them holy, so that the human race, bounded by one world, may be enlightened by one faith and united by one bond of charity. And so we approach the table of this wondrous sacrament, so that bathed in the sweetness of your grace, we may pass over to the heavenly realities here foreshadowed. Therefore, all creatures of heaven and earth sing a new song in adoration, and we, with all the hosts of angels, cry out, and without end, we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the font of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, Joseph, our Bishop, and all who serve your people. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Father, have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, 
in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not in our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant us peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer one another a sign of Christ's peace. Peace, Bob. takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word in my soul.
Let us pray. Grant, O Lord, we pray, that we may delight for all eternity in that share in your divine life which is foreshadowed in the present age by our reception of your precious body and blood who live and reign forever and ever. Keegan, congratulations on your first Holy Communion. Thank you for being here. We have a special gift for you from the parish. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Mass is ended. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord and one another. Thanks be to God. Amen.